So the ungodliness has created curses. I said this this morning, and I think the number's been affirmed. You know, I think we've killed 60 million babies now. I don't know where you put that. 60 million children did not have a life, and they were, you know, killed before they were born. And uh, you just can't do stuff like that forever. I'm surprised we've gone as long as we've gone. The... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something here. I didn't say it this morning, but I'm, I'm going to say something here. I'm not sure that we'll escape. Uh, you know how, I don't know, I hate to say judgment, but I'm not sure we'll escape the consequences of that. But I think they'll be postponed by prayer. I think we should pray and keep it from happening and hope the next generation prays and keeps it from happening. Because we really don't want what we should get. We really don't want what we should get. And God's merciful enough. If we'll obey him and we'll repent, and I, I believe he will stay. See, I believe that President Trump was a stay of execution, like him or not. It has nothing to do with like or dislike. He's a stay of, of things. He was put there to hold things back. And if you want him held back, you, you ought to consider that. Because he, he, he's created space for us. We wouldn't have any space at all. And I believe that was the Lord's design. So you might consider that in your thinking. So we're at, God is wanting his church to be effective now. Okay? What do you do when you want to become effective and you own a business? You shed all the stuff you don't need. If you own a business and you're going broke, if you don't shed it, you are going to finish going broke. But if you, you can arrest your business in the middle of it by hiring, firing, changing expenses, and altering your purchases and starting to buckle down. Many businesses have survived because they made adjustments, even though they weren't nice, even though they made enemies by the people they laid off and all those things that changed. They had no choice if they were going to survive because if they didn't survive, nobody would have a job and there wouldn't be a company. So there are changes that need made. So when you're going through something, uh, and you want to get things done, you start to remove unnecessary things from your life. We're going to switch that over to the Spirit. There are people in your life that probably don't need to be in it anymore. There are things in your life that probably shouldn't be there. There are things that need removed from your life so you can become effective. It's hard to be effective when you don't have a focus. And if you're focused on everything and you don't want to get rid of anything... You're not going to be effective because you're trying to bring everything with you that you don't need into the next vision. Anybody hear that? You can't have it all. Everybody says, I want it all. I'm going to say, well, you'll just have it all, but you won't have nothing because you won't have a purpose when you have it all. When you have a purpose, you limit your choices to what makes you effective. That's what makes athletes good. They eliminate things, and they do what they're going to do to be effective. That's what makes people wealthy. They eliminate things. You know, just to touch business people for a minute, investing style. I want you to think about this. They're not consumers. They're investors. They don't look at what they're, the things they're going to get. They look at the, the wealth they're going to create or the winning mindset. They already know that if they got the money, they're going to get the things. So they don't go after the things. The things are a side issue of money. They are not the wealth. Things just kind of come. But they are investors, not consumers. They're two different mindsets. Consumers want to get more and more stuff. Investors want to find more ways to invest and create an income. And they're, they, they look the same, you know, but on the outside. But they're volumes apart. That's why in, uh, did you ever notice when you're talking to consumers, if you start talking to them about investing, they get bored and they lose interest in what you're saying because you're not talking about getting things. You're talking about sacrifice and investment and you lose them right there. You lose them right there when you start talking about what it takes to sacrifice and become an investor. And if, and if they're building generational wealth, they're actually willing to do without it for their generation so the next generation doesn't have to start at zero. Which, we'll just take that one step further. That's why you gotta make sure your kids understand money you have to teach them to understand money, what money is and how it works, what wealth is and how it works. That's just a thought. It's not done very successful because most kids are not interested in it. It's very hard to transfer that. Many a business have been started and lost by, the, by one generation and lost by the next generation because the kids didn't understand the sacrifice it took to get it. And when they get it, they don't see it as a sacrifice. They see it as things. 
and it's not things. It's stewarding. It's stewarding resources. Anyway, so things are changing, Joshua 5.12. And the manna ceased. Verse 11 says, and they did, they did eat of the old corn of the land. Now, when you're in transition, you have to eat from what you used to do till you eat from what you're going to do. Most, think about this for a minute. If you like the security of knowing what's going to happen, you're going to look at the old all the time, and everything, every time you get that you've got to move away from it, you're going to consider it loss. Because you're looking at what you used to do and see when you when you're in transition, you've got to look at what you're going to do and just use this much up until you get there. You understand? You're using the old resources to go to the new place. But if you're trying to keep everything the way it was, it'll run empty and you won't have moved. You'll run out of both. You've got to make the transition. The whole world is in for a reset. The financial system and political, everything's being reset. We don't know what they're going to do with the money, but they have made a quality decision to print, 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 print. And they're going to print, and, and, and nobody who's ever printed didn't make bread 20 bucks. Okay? So it's something you might think about that if they keep printing, you know, you're going to be paying a lot of money for a lot of stuff over time. I don't know how long, and I've always known it could happen because that's what we've done. But they made a decision they're going to bail out everybody, so you might think about they probably already know what the next currency is. They probably already know what their next move is, but they haven't told you. Just to give you some thoughts. They haven't told you. So you have to look at it as you're going into a transition, and if you try to hang on to the new, you'll probably be left behind. You might as well learn to embrace what's coming and start studying what's coming so you are ready for what's next. It's a principle. It's all through the Bible. It's all through the Bible. You know, Moses was trying to get the people ready to go into the promised land. So they were transitioning from slavery to freedom. The church in the New Testament was transitioning from law to grace and to the Holy Ghost. And he said that they had to get filled with the Holy Ghost. So that was a transition. It was a reset. Being filled with the Holy Ghost was the church being reset to do New Testament work. There's always a reset. Always something being reset. And I know this is real hard on phlegmatic personalities because they hate change. But I'm encouraging you in the name of Jesus. Start getting flexible enough so, so the transition don't almost kill you. You know, a lot of, even cholerics, which I'm a high choleric, I get tired of changing. And I, sometimes I just don't want to because I'm tired. You know, I mean, I, there's enough goes on in my life that sometimes I'm just tired. I, 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 don't, I, I don't want any, I don't want to have to look for the salt. The salt better be where it was supposed to be because I don't want to mess with the salt. It's not that it minds that I don't want another challenge while I'm in the middle of my dinner where I got to look for a salt shaker. I want to know where the salt is when I do it or whatever. But when I'm rested, I know that that's not life. That's only when I'm tired. And you've heard me say this before. Vince Lombardi put it the best, and I'm going to requote him again. Fatigue makes cowards out of great men. And tell me when you're tired, does it look impossible? Does everything look bigger when you're... I go to bed sometimes, and next morning I wake up, and I'm not even upset about anything. <laughs> I think to myself, what was that? I was so miserable yesterday. I think I was just tired. And, and I think you have to rest, and you have to have time to think. And then you have time to hear God. You have to have time to hear God. So the day came when the manna ceased. And the transition came. Now I don't know how they felt about it. But you realize it would be like if you had somebody making your meals. You know it blew in the quail. The water came out of the rock and the manna was on the ground. And God called them having to farm and work really hard a blessing. <laughs> it was. It was time to work. It was time to work. It wasn't time to be fed supernaturally. It was a time to work. Um, you know, working. You remember that movie, Elf? I quote a couple things from it. Working. Working's your favorite thing. <laughs> couple laughs. Not everybody liked that one. Okay, we'll talk about something else. Working. 
working. Working is supposed to be your favorite thing, if you know what I mean. If you're working in your purpose, it helps. But if you're working toward your purpose, that's good too. But you should always have something in mind. This is, I'm going to just go here just because I heard it. But I have to admit to you, sometimes I get discouraged because I don't hear any young people saying, I want to get married and have kids and have a house. I know that sounds like the American dream and all that, but, but the, not, the desire not to have a family puzzles me because by nature, that's what you're supposed to have. You know, this, for this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one, and you have kids. Somehow the devil has nullified the marriage and family thing enough the, either the kids don't think it's possible or they don't want it for some reason. I don't really understand it fully. But I know by nature that's how we were made. Don't you think that needs brought down to the, you know, reset to the level that it should be, that it's normal to want to be a mom, it's normal to want to be a dad and have kids and be, you know, it's normal. Those are, that was normal. And that's been normal for thousands of years, but it seems like in this generation something has got to get in substituted for that vision. Maybe it, uh, they don't care. I don't really know. Anyway, so they had to start working. You know, they're, they're spoils of the promised land. What's in what I thought was really interesting, only the people who didn't complain got to go. If you didn't complain in the last season, you got to go the next season. If you complained in the last season, you die there. That's how I know going like this. Well, I, I, we used to do this. This is what we did in Egypt. We ate leeks and onions, and, and I, don't, I want to eat my old corn. But God wants you to turn around and face the new meal and face the new life. They more, those Israelites complained about what they didn't have that was in Egypt, and God was going to give them everything. But they died complaining because they hated the transition. They didn't want to have the process to make the transition. So they were looking at the old, that's how I know you gotta turn around and look at the reset. You gotta look at the reset. Whatever the financial system is, whatever the educational system is. I mean, believe it or not, the new, the new thing now is to become a, a, a plumber and, le, and a mechanic and things because they don't have anybody to fix anything. I mean, that's, that's sort of funny how the old thing can all of a sudden become new, but there's nobody to do it. Try to hire contractors. Try to hire people to do physical work there aren't any physical laborers. I mean, air conditioning people, there's a lot of fields if you like working with your hands, you can go get in. They talked to all those kids that are going to school and, and borrowing fifty and $60,000 and working at McDonald's because they never got a job. I mean, that's, you talk about cheating somebody, a lot of them people were probably supposed to work with their hands, but they told them to go to college. And they could have made hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And so you understand, out of that group, I'm just going to say this, if that's where your bend is, is physical, and, and you don't think it's crazy, but you can go from being a, a truck driver to an owner of a fleet of trucks. I think when you get in your vein, you end up owning a vein when you're where you belong. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're not, that's fine. But if you start out working as a plumber, you have your own plumbing company. See? Because, see, you're gifted to do it, so you're in where you belong, and so the, the vision is there. You can do it. But when you're out of place and you're just working for money, you never get to get there. And it's really big to me to do what's in you. I've, I've said that to you many times over the years. That's, when I go to the prison, I told you this, I don't ask them what they did wrong. I ask them what they want. I'm sorry. I hope this don't sound bad. I don't really care what they did wrong. They're captive. They're a captive audience. I got them already. I don't have to go there. <laughs> I can talk to them about what they want to do so they don't go back to what they were. I, talk, I always talk about where do you want to go. That's why when people tell me the same problem over and over again, I'll be honest with you, I get so annoyed, I just want to say, shut up. I already know that. I want to know what do you want to do. I'm already on solving it, and you're still complaining about it. I hope it doesn't sound too bad, but I think those thoughts. I want to tell them, look, you're still complaining. 25 minutes ago, I made a decision that I was going to help you go to the next place, but I can't get you out of this place long enough to take you to the next place. And if I can't get you there, we might as well stop talking because I'm already out and I'm running with the vision that you're going to have for your life and you're stuck and I can't get you out. 
You're taking up, I'm, I'm already solving the problem and you're still living it. That might sound real thick skin, but if you did it for 20 or 30 years, it might not be. You know, how many of you know, and I don't know your name, but I met you a thousand times. There are things that you hear over and over and over again that you, you know there's patterns and triggers. God wants to know what you want. It took me a while to figure that out, too. You know, I, I'm going to quote David again, uh, God and King David. And I used this used it intermittently over the years, but, you know, David took Uriah's wife, and all God said to him is, if you wanted more, why didn't you ask me? Why did you take what was somebody else's? God's willing to act on what you want, if you want it. But complaining is a sign you don't want it. It's the proof that you don't want it is the complaining. Because if you really wanted it, you'd forget about what was and look at what could be. I was talking earlier about the, the COVID. I don't think about sickness at all. Can I, can I be honest with you? I, have, I mean, I fight things, but I don't make them my focus. I have never not forgotten my mask once. I have to go back and get it every time. Every door I walk up to, I read the sign and go, and I got, I got to walk a football field away to go get my mask when I go to stores and stuff. It's not that I, I am being rebellious. I go back and get my mask. But that, uh, the sickness isn't on my day-to-day -day moment life. I never think about it. I never think about it. So consequently, since it's not on my mind, I'm not thinking about sickness. I'm thinking about my mission. I'm thinking about what I want to do. So I have to be reminded that you're supposed to wear a mask because I'm not thinking about being sick. I'm conscious of what I'm doing, not conscious of the devil trying to make me sick at all. Do I take precautions? Yeah, but it isn't like right here all day. I got to worry about it. That's wrong. You could concentrate on God. God should be what's in front of you, not COVID. God should be what's in front of you. He'll tell you what to do. Now, I didn't say defy the law, and I didn't say be stupid, did I? But I'm telling you, make sure you got the right thing in front of you. It could be your mate's faults that you put in front of you. It could be your checkbook. It could be your fears. Make sure that what's in front of you isn't controlling you. Make sure you got the right thing in front of you, no matter what the topic is. So, amen. Pentecost. Okay, rearrangement of seating, Luke 14. I'll close with this. God is resetting his church, and he's resetting its priorities. Uh, don't flinch. Nobody will know what we're talking about. <laughs> but when you look back and you watch the display of Christianity in the 80s, and I watched all them shows, and all the flamboyancy and all the elaborate things that went on on the TV for Christianity. How does it look to you now? How does it look to you now? Don't look the same, does it? It looks like you didn't need all that to, be, to get it, the job done. God wants, I'm not saying they should or shouldn't because they had to do a lot of that to, you know, when God wants to change something, that pendulum's got to go way out here before it comes back. Like when you want to undo unbelief, you've got to make faith a message to where they're sick of hearing it. And when they're just about sick of hearing it, you let it come back to the middle. When you want to talk about love, because you know you got to do that, whatever you want, to, prosperity. I mean, it just seemed like all anybody preached for years was prosperity. Everybody got tired of the message, but everybody was broke when they started, you know? So it didn't hurt them to learn about prosperity. But God had to swing that pendulum. So that, that stuff in the 80s, I think, was a, was a way of God swinging the pendulum. But anyway... Uh, rearrangement of seating, 14, 1 through 11, okay? We'll start with verse 8. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thee be bidden of him. And he asked and bade thee, bid thee, or he told him, no, words, go in the back so I can sit this guy in the front. He's telling them, you got to, there's going to be a rearrangement in the seating in the kingdom of God. He dealt with the Pharisees, but now he's telling them things are going to change. 
A different breed of people are going to lead. A different breed of people are going to be the Christians that are regular people that do not need the high places. They do not need to be seen. They don't need to be known. They just, they just want to be good Christians and do the job. And those are the people that God is looking for. God's eyes are looking to and fro on people that don't have to be seen. Verse 11 says, Whoever exalts himself will be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. It's a heart condition of humility that raises you up, not your gift, not your blog, not your nothing. It's a heart condition that God raises up. He doesn't raise up your talent. He raises up your character. Hallelujah. Rearrangement of seating is coming. So God says, when you have a feast, I'm going to go to Luke 14, 13. He says, when you have a feast, he says, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Wow. And thou shalt be blessed. And by others, invite those people that can't repay you. He says, invite people. Minister to people who can't give you nothing back. Now I'm going to touch that for a minute because that short wave of which we're consummating very soon. That's what we're doing. We're, we're, by faith, we are going to send a message of hope to people what we will not see till we go to heaven. There will be no immediate rewards other than you know you have done the will of God. And some results we will not see while we're on this earth at all. Yet we will give money to it, rearrange our lives for it, and sacrifice for it to be because God wants those people reached it's just not what everybody likes to do. That's why it's hard to get people to fund things like that. It's hard to get people to fund things that they don't, they don't see or there's no benefit on this earth. We're geared to have benefits now, but he is telling you that there are rewards in heaven for that. It says here, but when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the lame, you know, blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot repent thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. You will not be compensated till that day. He is saying there are things that you do on this planet that you will not get the credit nor see it till you go to heaven. That's called real faith. There's faith for things and then there's faith for things you can't see. That's when you know you really think about it. When you can give to something you know you're not going to see in this lifetime. You're not going to see it, but you know God told you to do it. You're getting there. You're living, for the, you're living for another dimension. You're living in another world. And you're not going to get a lot of support doing that because people will not even understand what you're doing. But when you get there, he'll say, you'll say to him, when, when, did we, hmm, when did we feed you? When did we see you? He says, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. That's where God is going. I'm not telling you God's done with all the hoopla in church, but I'm telling you he's done with all the hoopla in church. <laughs> he's done with that method. He wants things grassroots. Your neighbor, your neighbor might need something. And if you don't know him, you won't know what he needs. If you're not friendly, you, you, he won't talk to you. I love the thought of neighborhood churches. I do. I'm a, I love the. I'm a relational person. Where I buy my gas used to be important to me because you didn't pay with a credit card. You went in and paid the attendant and you talked. I mean, I, I'm I'm a walking relational thing. Like wherever I go, I just. Are you leave me? As she says, "Who are you talking to now?" If you leave me somewhere, it's going to take me about a minute and a half, and I'm going to have a conversation, and I'm going to like it, whether they're different than me or not. I'm going to like it. Getting to talk to people and letting them talk. You build relationships. That's where we're going. That's where we're going. I don't want the church to get so digital it doesn't have to see a person. I know online's cool, but in person's probably better. Amen? I'm sharing my heart with you today so you understand the church is being reset. It's not just this church. God is resetting his church to the right priorities because there's been a season change. And don't try to hold on to the old corn. Embrace the new things. If you don't want to learn about digital money, you're probably going to have to. 
Because if they want to eliminate it, you're going to have to use your phone. That's just one topic. God wants to change things to get them back to where the church is effective again, not just there. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Father, you said you want an effective church. Jesus was effective. Your son was effective. Paul was effective. Peter was effective. Timothy was effective. Moses was effective. But all those people were willing to change. Saul became Paul. Peter became a rock. The son of thunder became the son of love, John the, the Beloved. Everyone that you had underwent changes, God. Every single person underwent changes. And I thank you, God, that you will take us through the steps of change. And we will embrace what we need to embrace and we'll let go of what we need to let go, but we will not be compromised in our character. God, form our character that we can make the transitions and not get lost in the technology or call it all evil. Things take on our identity, Lord. Make sure our identity can handle all those things. In the name of Jesus. It's funny. If you had a dirty book when I was a kid, you was a really bad person. But now you can watch pornography online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Be dirty as all get up. It's funny how you can secretly sin with technology. See, your character has to work because you can't save yourself from everything. You have to not get involved with everything. You know, the technology isn't going to go away. Technology isn't going to go away. You just have to have, to have the character to use it the right way. There'll be always somebody using it for evil, but you have to have the character to use it the right way. In the name of Jesus. God, give us grace, grace, grace to change, but not compromise. To learn new things and not become bad things. That we will take the mind, we will take the mind of Christ into every situation, the word in every situation. Thank you, God, for this time together. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, so be it. And amen.